Thanks a lot for this opportunity. It's, a, it's absolutely a delight for me to really come here and talk about India and the whole idea of competitiveness and entrepreneurship in India. So what I'll try to do today is that I'll give you a quick rundown on what my idea about competitiveness in India is, what, what do I think about entrepreneurship there, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'll speak for about 40 minutes. That's the thing that has been instructed to me. Uh, so if you really look at entrepreneurship, what is it all about? The way I actually look at it, it's a very simple kind of a concept wherein we are saying that we use land, labor, and capital, we bring it together, and we actually create something unique out of it. So, and this is also the very basis in terms of like, how do we actually use our resources for creating competitiveness in the world? So one of the ba basic pillars that we are really talking about is about factor conditions. How do we use these factor conditions and how productive those factor conditions are? In fact, when we really talk about enterprise or entrepreneurship, the critical factor is that if I'm able to use these factors well, if I'm able to make them productive, that's when the whole set of things start functioning. That's when wealth actually starts getting created. Of course, there are a lot of uh, theoretical underpinnings, which I will not really cover here for the talk, but then if you really look at it, there have been people like Schumpeter and so on and so forth, who have really talked about the idea of ent entrepreneurship, innovation and things. But when you talk about an entrepreneurial ecosystem, what is it that we have to really understand or look at? The whole entrepreneurial ecosystem has to really talk about a number of set of things. So the first one being a policy and regulatory environment. So the question here that we are actually trying to delve into is whether we actually have a great policy environment within the Indian context. So what we are really saying here is the doing business indicators, or whether it is easy for people to really come into India, be entrepreneurs, or they are actually supported within the system at all or not. This next thing is talk about funds, whether funds are available, what is the whole situation about capital, whether the VC markets function, and so on and so forth. The next thing that we are really talking about, basic level infrastructure. We will get into these kind of situations and numbers as we actually go along. A very, system, very simple idea in terms of like what's the conceptual model linking institutional frameworks of innovation systems and entrepreneurship and competitiveness. This is part of your course that you would have actually done. I'll not really go into this, but the idea was to really set the ball rolling in terms of thinking as to what are the various ideas from where I'm actually building the whole uh, talk. So what is competitiveness then? Competitiveness, very clearly, is the productivity with which we actually use or create productivity through the resources that we actually use. In fact, it's about the value that I actually get. A very simple set of answers or questions here. When we talk about a software engineer in India versus a software engineer in the United States, what is the difference? The difference is very clearly in terms of productivity that we actually see. The productivity of a software engineer in India is close to about $30,000 per year. But when you talk about software engineer in the United States, it's close to about half a million dollars a year. That is actually a very interesting number that we can actually look at. And quite interestingly, when you talk about the IT industry, in fact, when we talk about the whole idea of information technology or the whole idea of uh, entrepreneurship, we do talk about IT industry in India. And I would like to really set the ball, set the tone here that a lot of times we actually make a mistake in terms of thinking that IT is the biggest thing that has actually happened out of India. But that's a huge mistake that we actually make. A very simple set of numbers. What are the number of people who actually work within that industry? The number of people who are actually impacted by the IT industry in India is just about 5 million. In a country which is close to about 1,300 million people, 5 million actually has no bearing at all. In fact, you can actually say from a world point of view, 5 million seems stunning, but from an Indian context, 5 million is actually a very, very small number. So if you really look at these ideas and just delve deeper into what this whole industry is all about, there's something very interesting. When you talk about competitiveness of a nation, I always say, in fact, that this is a construct which, was, which has been talked about, and uh, Professor Dasher also talked about it, that there are three stages in which how or how the, the whole idea of a nation goes, or how economic activity grows. So it is about factor conditions, the next is, uh, or you talk about factor-driven economy to a, innovation, to a manufacturing-driven economy or an efficiency-driven system to an innovation-driven system. So let's try to understand India per se. What is India all about? India is clearly a factor-driven system. It's a factor-driven economy because what we are doing there is we are talking about labor arbitrage. Very clearly, it is about labor arbitrage. Because I think what happens is, so when you are talking about labor arbitrage, that also has a huge bearing in terms of what kind of entrepreneurship would actually come across. 
or what kind of entrepreneurs would actually be there, or what kind of systems, or what kind of business models is what we would actually be seeing over a period of time. Quite interestingly, when we talk about these factor-driven uh, system that we are actually having in India, what we are seeing is that we are, we are, it's a battle between created prosperity and inherited prosperity. Because India is very clearly, as I say, a battle of inherited prosperity, wherein we are trying to use the people, but we have not really migrated to the next level in terms of how the whole idea of a country can actually be, how we can actually create wealth for the people. Let's try to look at a few set of numbers here. The numbers are absolutely very interesting. If you really look at the world economy, what is the impact of the world of Indian economy on the world economy, or what's the percentage? India is just about 2.9% of the total world's GDP. China is 9.5%, and that's how the difference is. And when you talk about the United States, it's close to about 26%. The European Union is close to about 24%. So what we are seeing here is that a country which is about 2.5%, so what is it that it is actually doing? And 2.4% with about 20% of the world resource in terms of people. And that means that whole idea of per capita income, or it's actually a very, very poor country from a person-specific basis. And when you talk about this, that means it's about entrepreneurship, which is going to go into a direction which is hugely different. So if you really look at it, when you talk about the competitiveness, these are the various factors that we have to actually understand and look at. And what are these factors that we need to look at? Very clearly, it's about sophistication of company operations. What is the kind of diversity of firms? What kind of state of cluster development actually exists? Whether there is some kind of an interaction that actually happens within a diverse set of firms? Whether there are enough clusters that have actually got formulated over a period of time? But then, of course, what we are really seeing here is coming to a very interesting set of understanding that we have to build. When we talk about competitiveness, it is dependent on four distinct pillars. The first one being, say, the factor conditions. We did talk about people. We did talk about labor, but let's not try to understand infrastructure itself. Because once we understand infrastructure, then we actually understand that what is it that we are really talking about, or how doing business is actually an issue, or how creation of enterprise could actually be a challenge. When you talk about the Indian context, there's something very interesting. In the Indian context, the average speed of traffic is close to about 35 kilometers per hour. That looks very interesting, but that was a figure for 2001. But if you really talk about the figure for this year, it is close to about 25 kilometers per hour. That means movement of goods, movement of people, is actually a huge challenge. So when you're actually talking about these kind of set of numbers, that means the cost of doing business increases exponentially. And people are not really talking about it. So what is it that we can actually do with these kind of situations? When you talk about power, the most interesting city in India, say Gurgaon or Bangalore, uh, more specifically, Gurgaon, which is supposedly one of the IT hubs, it actually has close to about eight hours of power cuts on an average in a day. Today, if you're actually trying to do a comparative statement between uh, which place should I actually locate my unit, if I actually do a comparison between uh, Gurgaon and Alabama, you might actually decide that let's go to Alabama because the cost of doing business in Alabama is actually much lower. The overall cost of doing business. So when you actually talk about competitiveness, the question is, it just cannot be run on what we would actually call as labor arbitrage. You have to really talk about something else. You have to talk about innovation, which is a little different. You have to talk about value addition, which is higher. And let, let's try to understand a, uh, a few set of examples here. We are sitting in the hotbed of technology here. And one of the most smartest companies that we always talk about is Apple. And when you talk about I always ask a question that why is it that India has not been able to produce an apple in its country? Or why is it that we don't have a Skype in our country? Or why is it that we do not actually have a Yahoo in our country? Why is it that it all happened out here? Because the kind of people, if you are actually talking about engineers, who are definitively the kind of people that you would want for creation of enterprise, especially in the area of technology, 1.1 billion engineers every year. That's the number of engineers that actually come out in that country or pass out in that country, 200,000 MBAs. So if you are really talking about these numbers here, what is it that we are actually doing with them? What is it that, I, that these guys are actually doing in terms of productivity, in terms of the way they're actually engaging themselves? So what they're effectively doing is that they are what we would actually call as being actually in a place where they're actually becoming cyber coolies. 
It's a fairly derogatory term, but what we are actually saying is that they're just simply doing a fairly mundane work of something, something very interesting that they would find or whatever, but it is not high value added. And when we talk about this whole aspect, we have to look a little deeper as well. So when you talk about these numbers, it is simply true that it is not only about technology, it is actually happening across the board. It is happening across different sets of products as well. When you talk about clothing or apparels, what is happening in apparels? There's something very interesting that happens within the apparel segment. Quite a lot of apparels are actually being made in India, but they're actually being sold in the United States with a multiple of eight. That means the minimum multiplying factor on the price point from the time of uh, the, the transfer price from India to the shop floor is eight times. What does that actually mean? That means it's the power of branding that actually is functioning very, very well. Can we actually create a brands which are absolutely stunning? Because at, at the end of the day, when you really talk about uh, enterprise, entrepreneurship, what is it that I need to do? I need to actually talk about intellectual property. I need to talk about innovation, or I need to talk about branding. And is any of these things really actually happening within the system? If it is happening, it is happening to a very limited extent. But there are opportunities and there are options which are absolutely big. Of course, the drivers of productivity, these are the drivers of productivity that we would actually talk about. Quality of overall business, cluster development, to policy coordination, and so on and so forth. But coming to this whole interesting thing, when we talk about India, and when we have to talk about understanding India from an enterprise perspective or entrepreneurship perspective, I cannot look at India from a big lens of saying just one country. We have to understand that India is actually different locations. It's a different reality. It is at least 29 different states. It's a big, vast country. So when you actually talk about India, you have to really discern it at multiple levels of geography. And when we talk about multiple levels of geography, that means I have to understand it from the perspective of states or provinces and districts, or what you would call as counties out here. We have to really go deeper and understand what are the positives in a various set of locations or etc. But coming to this very interesting slide, which I thought I should share here, we were talking about those numbers in terms of like how, how India is actually performing and what is the impact of India on the global economy. This is something very interesting again. So if you really look at it, where is the manufacturing sector for India right now? It is just about 15% of the total GDP of India that we are actually seeing. So when you talk about make in India, there is a possibility. But the question is going to be, do we have the right infrastructure for doing it? But discerning the prosperity in India a little deeper. This is something very interesting. So when you talk about India growing at a rate of about 8% or 9% on an average, where is it actually happening or where is it growing? And this becomes a very important factor in understanding how India is actually moving ahead over a period of time. The numbers here. So there are something like eight or nine states which are growing at a rate which is greater than 8%. And the, most of the other states are actually laggards. They're actually on the left, and you would see that. So when you're actually talking about locations which are doing well or beating the whole growth trajectory, that's where a lot of activity is also getting centered. In fact, when you, but then of course, there are those aberrations. There is an aberration called Bihar here, which grows at about 12%, but with a per capita GDP, which is just close to about $200, or maybe $300. In fact, in Indian rupees, it is close to about 17,000 rupees, which is close to about $300. And of course, then there is a state of Goa, or there is a state of Delhi, wherein the per capita income is greater than 140,000 uh, rupees. But what does this actually mean? That means this is a very strong indicator of economic activity and economic activity agglomeration. But before we actually go into those numbers, there is something very interesting that I thought I should really talk about. Quite interestingly, when you talk about understanding a country, there is something, the whole idea of creative class. What is it that we actually do with our talent? What about technology? What about tolerance? In fact, when you actually talk about the creativity index that we actually do for the Indian cities and Indian states, we actually use these three paradigms. And this is where we actually get some very interesting numbers. In fact, there was a very interesting debate that happened recently. President Obama, during his visit to India, had actually said that India should be a little more tolerant. He actually said that. I'm not even, and fairly rightfully so. There are issues that we really need to actually tackle. And we actually look at these set of indicators to understand, because if you really look at it, 
locations which are able to accept weirdness are the locations where agglomeration of economic activity happens. When, when you actually talk about this location that we are actually sitting in, what is one of the biggest reasons for this location to be one of the hotbeds of innovation? Because we have actually been able to accept weirdness in people. And then that is actually what happens. In fact, when you talk about a place like India, if you're not accepting that weirdness, activity is not going to happen. It's always about the creative set of people who drive change. It's always, if you really look at it, uh, the artists, the designers, or other set of people who could actually come together with scientists and engineers or doctors to really give you the solutions. There's a very simple construct that we always say. It is about the Medici effect. That can I actually bring in two schools of thought together to really find an answer for a problem? So is it going to be biology coming with physics or biology coming with business to find an answer? Of course, that's the way the world is actually going to be. So it's about agglomeration of different sets of people at a certain location. If that is not happening, then of course, things are not really going to be a hotbed of innovation. You might actually end up into a system which copies. When you actually talk about India, and if you really go to the cities, or understanding the creative economy of Indian states, this is how actually India looks like. In fact, if you really look at the numbers, Maharashtra is one of the states which is ranked fairly high on the creativity index. And this is a state which contributes close to about 17% of India's GDP. And in fact, when you talk about Maharashtra per se, if you start discerning a, lit a little deeper or going a little deeper, you would find something even more interesting. That just six locations out of these, out of that state, or six cities out of Maharashtra, contribute 90% of Maharashtra's GDP. That means it is the agglomeration of activity that is happening at locations, and that was driven by weirdness. Because what are the locations that the things are actually happening? It is happening in Mumbai. Mumbai is supposedly one of the hotbeds of activity, wherein we are able to accept people of different sets of uh, tastes, ideas, views, and so on and so forth. Pune, for that matter. And that is where it is happening. The whole emergence of Bangalore, it actually happened because of that. So when you are actually talking about this, this very interesting thing, what we can actually see, the number of factories and competitive intensity and diversity of firms. So if you really look at it, wherever we actually see a huge diversity of firms, that is where we are also seeing some entrepreneurial activity. That is where we are seeing that, yes, there is some kind of innovation that is actually happening. That means that there is, of course, a significant effect of clusters actually getting formulated. But going to the states a little deeper, when I say, when you actually talk about countries, you always say that countries have to be adjudged from a bigger perspective of saying they are actually factor-driven or factor-driven economies, efficiency-driven economies, or innovation-driven economies. If you really look at the states as well, they have to be bifurcated into that aspect itself. So India cannot be looked at under one single lens. It has to be looked at from the lens of saying that, of course, there are states which are factor-driven. There are states which are efficiency-driven. There are states which are innovation driven. And you would actually find that economic activity and entrepreneurial activity actually gets agglomerated at a certain level. Let me show you the numbers here, or some statistics here. So if you really look at the innovation driven, when I say innovation driven, it is actually, you might even say to me that it's force fitting that methodology. Maybe yes. But the question here is that it actually gives me a very strong indicator as to how or where entrepreneurial activity is happening, or where it is actually where, where people are actually looking at doing something significantly different. So if you really talk about the state of Maharashtra, the state of Gujarat, Maharashtra and Gujarat combined contribute 44% of India's exports. That's something very, very interesting. So two states contributing such a huge major impact to the economy of the country. Tamil Nadu is where the various sets of clusters have actually emerged the whole IT cluster, the whole idea of the automotive cluster, which actually happened there. Because there is a lot of economic activity that started happening there. But there is something very interesting that we have to understand and look deeper into. It's about untangling the linkages between city competitiveness and economic growth. So if you really look at it, this is a very interesting slide that I thought I should share. So if you, states with a high degree of urbanization tend to have greater GDP or state level GDP itself. So that means urbanization is a very important indicator of how economic activity can actually get created. 
So when you actually talk about this whole in system in India, wherein they say, oh yes, we have to build the right set of cities, we have to build the smart cities, it is being driven by this idea itself. Because urban areas create that agglomeration effect, bring in those people together to really create something interesting. Of course, the development of Indian cities, this is how the cities are actually there. There are a number of cities that are happening within India. But if you really look at the numbers, 53 cities with a population of over a million. And then, of course, expansion of cities or metropolitan regions. This is how these places have actually grown. And why I'm actually talking about these cities, for a simple reason. These are the cities which have actually shown a very strong indicator towards firm, uh, firm formulation or firm creation. We have looked at those numbers, but I'll actually come to those numbers as well. But a very quick snapshot in terms of like how the creative economy of cities or how the snapshot looks like or how various cities actually look like how the ranking actually comes in. So if you really look at these numbers, or if you really look at this index, what you would find is that it, the Bangalore, Bombay, Delhi, this is where entrepreneurial activity is actually happening. In fact, when you talk about a place like Bangalore, everybody knows Bangalore. Everybody knows Bangalore for a simple reason. That is where there are a very interesting set of people who are coming together to create the next set of firms. Uh, we are not even discussing or debating whether they are creating something significantly different from the West. Are they actually creating world-beating products? But yes, they are creating some unique business models. They are creating some unique propositions. Say the whole idea of Snapdeal, Flipkart. They were e effectively started from there. So that is what we are actually seeing or an evidence to that factor. And when you talk about competitiveness cities, and we are seeing cities which are creative they are also becoming a little more competitive over a period of time because acceptance of different views has an impact on performance or on the competitiveness of a city. So these are some rankings which I thought we, we should really look at. But coming to the challenges faced by entrepreneurs in India, what is it that we face in India today? What are the challenges that we are actually seeing? Quite interestingly, it's about funding. Are there enough and more people who are willing to seed fund? Is there that ecosystem that is available to actually do something? What is the cost of failure? Are people scared enough to fail out there or not? What a, do I actually have the right set of skilled people? In fact, something very interesting. You know, I, I actually met some people from England or United Kingdom recently, and they actually made a very interesting or a startling statement to me. They said in India, there are close to about uh, 30 crore people that is about 300 million people who are able to speak English. I was absolutely surprised because that figure is horribly wrong. For a simple reason, that is not even the number of people who have gone to school. So if that is the number, so what is happening is that we are also looking at numbers in a distinctly wrong way. We have to look at the right set of numbers. The whole definition of what is it, the skilled labor. What are the number of people who are actually able to do something? The right skilling, the whole idea of right skilling. And then, of course, hard infrastructure. We did talk about it. Infrastructure is a challenge. But the question is that within the problem itself, rise or arise the biggest set of opportunities in that country. And that is where you are seeing some unique activity. Let me give you an example here. If you really look at the cities, the cities actually see a very interesting problem of traffic. And this is how business idea actually did happen, and it is becoming a very interesting model for delivery of drugs to people in the cities today. Uh, in fact, the question is that if you really talk about a city like Delhi, on an average, a person is going to be stuck in traffic for about two hours. Right? If somebody has a heart attack on, in the car, what do you think is going to happen? The biggest possibility is that he's going to be dead. How do you solve this problem? You can't solve the problem of traffic. Right? Because I think one of the ways of really looking at it would be, let's solve the problem of traffic. Well, you can't do it because the number of people who are there in the city, you have 27 to 30 million people who are living there. You can't dismantle or dislodge them. You can't really move them out of the city. So you have to find a solution or an entrepreneurial solution to really taking care of this problem. So what do you do? How do you solve this problem? If any one of you has been to India, you would realize that there are those roadside kiosks from where you can actually buy cigarettes. In India, cigarettes are sold in packets of one and twos. So what do you do? You actually keep two medicines, sorbitrate and aspirin, at those kiosks. So if somebody feels that he's actually having a heart attack, he just goes to that location, picks up aspirin, and has it. The mortality rates are expected to go down by 97%. 
for people who are actually going through a heart attack or a cardiac incident. A very simple solution. That's what the kind of innovation India is actually requiring today. That is what we are really looking at. You have to solve the problems of people. I think a lot of times we always say it's the high-tech industry versus a low-tech industry. But is there something like a high-tech industry or a low-tech industry? I absolutely disagree with this very paradigm. For a simple reason, there is nothing like high-tech industry and low-tech industry. It's high-tech firms or low-tech firms. Because any industry, for that matter, can actually be high-tech. The question is, what is the kind of value add that I actually do with it? And of course, the local conditions will actually give you some impetus to really find solutions, but that's the way it is. A very simple idea. When you talk about Israel, what does Israel do in terms of agriculture? Agri in terms of agriculture, Israel actually did one of the most stunning, uh, what do you call, innovations, and that was about drip irrigation. So that was actually a very smart innovation, which changed the way we were actually looking at growing food. We were actually talking about saving water. So it was a very simple, innovative solution. So it was actually about, a lot of people could actually say it is not high tech. But then it was a very smart solution for the world. Similarly, when you actually talk about shoes, Italians actually make or sell the most expensive pair of shoes in the world. Probably they're actually made in India, but you've just not been able to create a brand around it. So this is what the whole world is actually about. How do we actually look at those systems? But coming to these numbers, when you talk about mapping the conversations around the innovation ecosystems, this is where a lot of excitement is actually happening. India is actually right now at the cusp or at the point where people are talking about this as being the entrepreneurial location. So there are about 15,000 conversations happening here. US, it is about 92,000. China is about 25,000. And why does this actually make very big sense? It makes huge importance for a simple reason that this is where people are looking at presenting solutions to the world, but unique solutions to unique set of problems. Moving ahead, so this is how the conversations are actually happening. These are a few set of figures you can actually look at. So if you really talk about India, when they talk about entrepreneurship, they talk about India, they talk about Bangalore, they talk about Bombay, they talk about New Delhi. When you are in the United States, you are also talking about India right now as an entrepreneurial hub. Why? For a simple reason, everybody understands the next set of innovations that are going to happen are going to be driven from there. A very simple idea here. When you say, like, why, why is it actually carrying such a huge set of uh, impact? Because the next set of things that are going to happen to the world, or the next set of innovations are going to come from the less developed world, or what you would actually call as the low resource settings, or countries with low resource settings. A very simple idea here would be that when you talk about economic objectives and social objectives, they are actually going to come together. They are going to be a very simple situation wherein we would say that we are going to actually solve social problems, and that is where enterprise creation is going to happen. And this is actually driven by a very simple paradigm, that the world tomorrow will actually need to have market-based solutions. And what are those market-based solutions? Those market-based solutions would actually be about solving the problems on ground. So if I talk about the problem of sanitation in India, we are going to be looking at a market-based solution. If you talk about the problem of water, you are going to be talking about a market-based solution. And that is where you would see a lot of innovation happening over a period of time. So when you say innovation and entrepreneurial activity in India, it is going to be driven on business models. It is not really going to be driven on technology. It is going to be about dis delivery of services. In fact, a lot of times, and when you talk about delivery of services, it can actually be riding on a technology platform, but at the end of the day, it is going to be about solving a distinct social problem that we are really looking at. And we are seeing more and more impact, or more and more evidence of that fact. I'll talk about those examples as we go ahead. Then, of course, there are some numbers that I thought, what are the total early stage entrepreneurial activity in India? why people are actually discontinuing. So if you would actually see, one of the biggest things is about access to finance. Do we actually have access to finance in India? In fact, this is something very interesting which I thought should share. When you talk about new firm density, which is a very interesting proxy of entrepreneurship and things, India is actually one of the lowest. Hong Kong is a country, or Hong Kong is a location, right? As a distinct location, does more firm formation or firm registration than India. That means there is right now a severe lack of 
entrepreneurial activity that we would have actually liked. Of course, whatever I say here, you might actually end up saying that the corollary is also true. The corollary could be true for a simple reason. Somebody can come to me and say that India is intensely entrepreneurial. Yes, India might actually get categorized as intensely entrepreneurial, but the question is, it is not about, what do you call it, in a, in a formal setting. It is activity which is actually happening within the informal setting. You could actually be a vegetable vendor for a small location. You could actually be a cigarette vendor in a small location. You are not able to scale up. So the challenge that we see here is about scalability. Can I actually create solutions within the informal system which can actually be scalable over a period of time? The Global Entrepreneurship Index. So if you really look at it, what are the, this chart clearly depicts as to uh, what, what is it, how is India actually performing on various set of indicators, and this is where it is. So in fact, opportunity of startup, one of the lowest ranks, and that is one of the challenges that we're really looking at. But then quickly moving into this whole idea of IT industry in India, I did talk about the IT industry. But the challenge here was that IT industry should not be really seen as a proxy for something which is happening or which is a very unique situation. Quite interestingly, when you talk about IT, as I gave you the numbers, it's about those productivity numbers of American software engineers versus the Indian software engineers. We need to find solutions which are going to be uniquely local. Quite interesting, this is where I thought there was one of the most intense entrepreneurial activity that has happened in the last 20 years or 30 years. And this is about the automotive cluster. Of course, this whole automotive cluster was actually seeded somewhere in the early 80s, but that was actually happening for a simple reason that you had Suzuki that was coming up. So when you actually had Suzuki coming up, that is when people started creating unique set of firms which are able to actually become part of the cluster. And that is where they actually, or we started seeing huge agglomeration of firms happening in distinct set of locations. And of course, over a period of time, we actually found that there were five distinct clusters which were actually moving up. And those five distinct clusters were what? One was, of course, you actually had the Haryana-based Manesar Gurgaon cluster. We actually had the emergence of Chennai as a cluster for automotives. We had the emergence of Aurangabad and Pune as the other two clusters. And of course, now we are actually seeing the emergence of Sanand as a location. But when you actually see, in fact, why am I talking about clusters here? The whole importance of clusters is that it is, if you are able to seed an enterprise, or if you are able to actually have a pillar firm or a, a fairly big enterprise who's willing to come in, we can actually call it as an anchor firm and there is a lot of entrepreneurial activity that can actually happen around it. And the government is actually looking at that whole proposition. In fact, for the first time in the history of independent India, there is a first administration which is talking about entrepreneurship in India, which has actually made it as part of the budget itself. In fact, until now, what we would have actually seen that we were all talking about job creation. Right? We were all talking about institutions which were created for job seeking. So today we are for the first time saying, oh, we have to be a country which is going to be talking about job creators rather than job seekers for the first time. In fact, the government of India allocated a budgetary thing. In fact, it was something very similar to what happened in the United States. This is the same thing that happened in this part of the world. The government of California actually allocated a huge budget in the 1950s for entrepreneurial activity. And that's the same kind of a thing that we are actually seeing within the Indian context now. Can the government seed something? Can the government actually support a set of entrepreneurs that we actually require? And then of course, there are those numbers that we can actually find, but what is it that we are actually looking at? Easy access to equity capital. The businesses are entrepreneurial hubs. But the biggest question is, what is the cost of failure? Can I actually accept failure within the Indian context? The whole cultural paradigm of failure and acceptance of failure. What is the present union government doing? As I said, they are actually for the first time allocating a budget, wherein they have said they're actually going to allocate close to about $2 billion for entrepreneurial activity. But moving very, very quickly on this, why is entrepreneurship important for India? Why are we even talking about it? Because if you really look at it, where is wealth actually generated? Wealth is always generated in firms. Wealth is always generated by new set of ideas. It's not generated anywhere else. Because if you want to actually reduce the level of disparity in that country, if I want to actually have a great quality of life for my people, what do I need to do? 
We need to actually talk about building an entrepreneurial culture. We need to talk about enterprise creation. Where there is no other way that you can actually talk about wealth or wealth creation and equitable distribution of wealth. Because if you really talk about, there are two systems that we are talking about here. The system of about this whole socialistic idea that we will distribute wealth. It never functions. It never works. The whole idea of the capitalistic system wherein we say that let's actually get people going and let them actually create a unique sense of activity or a unique value proposition. That is what is going to change the world. And that is what I actually said as well. It was about that the whole set of social objectives and economic objectives will have to come together. The Honeybee Network is a very interesting network wherein we are actually seeing some Indian enterprises or Indian innovations which we are seeing. Of course, there is also a huge debate that is happening right now on the idea of Jugaad. Jugaad innovation and things. Jugaad is a very interesting word, but has a huge negative connotation because it is about shortcuts. And so we have to understand that it is not about Jugaad, it is about frugal innovation. It is about understanding that how can I actually create a solution in a low resource setting. In fact, very interestingly, when you talk about low resource setting, Bollywood is a very interesting example of how it actually functions within a low resource setting. In fact, why I actually talk about Bollywood here is, I wanted to give an example from Hollywood. There was a very interesting movie that was made recently called Gravity, which was a multi, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, what you call, uh, money was actually spent on making that movie. But there's a very interesting thing. The cost of sending the Mars mission in India was actually less than the movie called Gravity. That's a clear-cut evidence of what we call as frugal innovation. And, that, and I'm not even saying it is shortcuts. It is actually about frugal innovation. It is about trying to understand that how can I actually get the best out of resources that I actually have. Moving next, Mumbai Dabbawalas. This is one system, I'm sure you must have actually heard about it. This is one of the greatest uh, delivery systems that you could have actually seen in the world. This is absolute Six Sigma. In fact, even better than that, there is a system wherein you're delivering food to various offices, and they don't get it wrong at all. And why does that actually happen? Because they have created processes which are absolutely stunning, and it started about 50 years back. They've not gone wrong even once. So what we are really looking at is we have to really create a system for India than anything else. Of course, there is this whole India's angel uh, deals ecosystem that actually exists, which is for the sake of argument, if you really look at it, there is a lot of activity that is happening around here. There is Bangalore, Mumbai, and the whole Thai construct that is happening. But the question is, we have to go beyond it. People will have to think that they have to fund aspects which are beyond technology. They have to fund uh, businesses which actually solve social problems. Of course, the number of PE deals, this is something very interesting over the years. The, there is about 795 in 2014. And this is something very interesting. And of course, this is a figure from Bain. There is another figure that is actually floating around for another uh, consulting firm wherein the figures are hugely different. But now the question is whichever you want to actually believe. I like to believe this one. Uh, and that is where it is. And the overall uh, angel venture capital and PE financing ecosystem, we are actually seeing some very interesting numbers here. There is, of course, Center Bridge Partners, Alibaba, Tiger, and so on and so forth that we are seeing. But very quickly, just, just to skim through these numbers, I want to actually come to some conceptual underpinnings. But when you are actually talking about why is India laggard in creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem? Very quickly, lack of proper institutional support, lack of access to mentors. Do we actually have people who can actually support that activity? Because even today when we are standing here and talking about enterprise creation or entrepreneurship in India, people want you to get jobs. People want you to actually go ahead and get a jobs out of colleges. They do not want you to actually become entrepreneurs even today. And that is a predominant view. There is, of course, a lot of activity that we are seeing, but that is not the dominant view of things. Is there a link between competitiveness and innovation? And of course, enterprise creation and entrepreneurship, of course. Because if you really look at it, countries which have actually had huge level of enterprise creation and entrepreneurship, they have been fairly innovative and they have been fairly competitive over a period of time. So if you really look at it, this is where India actually is. And this is where the United States actually is. So what we are seeing is a clear evidence that innovation is actually driving competitiveness. Wherever you're actually seeing a lot of entrepreneurial activity that does drive competitiveness. 
If you really look at this very interesting set of numbers, patents by the USPTO. This is again a very interesting proxy. Of course, patents are a good proxy for innovation, but then the question is, where is United States and where is India? This actually gives you some very interesting set of numbers or factors of how things are. In fact, if you really start looking at the per capita numbers, this is a very stunning reality of what the world is all about. In fact, this is where, again, this was some very interesting work that we actually did. We tried to see as to how patenting and competitiveness at the state level are actually correlated. So we found a very clear evidence that, of course, when you actually have large or high patent activity in a certain state, they are more competitive states. And how are, you, how are we actually trying to understand the competitive states? So states which actually have higher per capita GDP. So of course, that is the, uh, what do you call, uh, dependent variable. Also, and that, that is where we are actually trying to find an answer to it. Similarly, the trends in patenting in India, but what if a country lacks a robust IP regime? In fact, one of the things which is stalling entrepreneurship is about IP, intellectual property. Can I actually protect my intellectual property? If I do not do that, then I will actually see a very clear-cut evidence of distortion in access of information, intellectual capital, and so on and so forth. When you talk about, you would actually face issues within the demand conditions. People will not really get the right set of products. You would see a lot of duplicates coming in and so on and so forth. In fact, if you really look at it, it actually distorts the whole idea of uh, industry structure as well. In fact, this is a very interesting thing that we did for the pharmaceutical industry, but we found that if you actually want people to come in and be doing something innovative out there, of, uh, then if there is not the robust IP regime, they would actually want to be going away from that location. So you, this is one of the factors which becomes exceedingly important that we need to actually look at. Similarly, if a IP system of an MNC versus that of a typical generic player. India today is actually very, at a very interesting stage wherein we are a very interesting generic, uh, I have what you call pharmaceutical manufacturing system. So there is a very huge difference, but then this is actually happening because we are not seeing uh, drug discovery that is actually happening within the Indian context. Why does that not uh, actually happen? Either we are not really funding a lot of research, or probably we are not even actually seeing uh, something in terms of uh, uh, what do you call people investing from even the West, or even wanting to go there and give the new set of medicines. In fact, does lack of trust undermine competitiveness? In fact, this is one aspect which I really wanted to touch base on. If you really talk about competitiveness and trust, this is one of the most important factors which drives enterprise creation. If I do not have trust in the system, then yes, enterprise creation can actually be very lower. If I do not actually have a system wherein we can actually have a very robust system or wherein I can go to the court of law and get immediate help, then things stop functioning in a very interesting way. And this is where the diamond actually gets distorted or the industry, or the diamond in the, within the country gets distorted, and we are seeing that. Impact of trust on the value chain of a firm. Trust actually has a huge implication on the activities of the firm as well. Because this, when I say trust, it is actually a very interesting proxy for corruption. So can we actually look at those systems, and can it actually have an impact on entrepreneurship? This is again, when you talk about pharmaceutical industry, the trust could be the missing element which could actually have an impact on entrepreneurship itself. Because what is the kind of activity that will happen? If there is lack of trust, that means transfer of technology is not going to happen. And if transfer of technology is not going to happen, if I'm not able to protect the IP, regime, IP of various sets of people, I cannot further the idea. I cannot work with them. And the newer set of ideas don't really come through. You have to start from a base level. And that is what, what is happening within a lot of industries that we are seeing. In fact, quite some interesting numbers on high-tech manufacturing in billions of USD. So if you really look at India, India is just about 14 billion even today. And when you talk about China, it is about 365 billion. So it's a fairly small number if we actually say that high-tech is one of the factors that we need to look at. High-tech manufacturing is percentage of world. But then if you really talk about role of private sector in economic development, this is what we have been really talking about. That it is the private sector which is going to create wealth, which is actually going to create a situation wherein distribution of wealth can actually happen. And then of course, what we are seeing is that we would see a lot of firms coming in in terms of creating local infrastructure. That is where the public-private partnership is also coming in. But then, something that I've actually been talking about, 
social objectives and economic objectives have to come together. I would like to talk about some very interesting examples. I would like to talk about the example of Mother Dairy. Mother Dairy is a very interesting business wherein 83% of its money that they actually get from the, from the consumers are actually given back to the farmers. That means on 17% margins, they are able to run a system which is fairly efficient. They have been able to create a business model which is profitable wherein 83% of the money goes to the farmer. That means there are distinct possibilities of creating systems which are unique to that part of the world. But those are the solutions that we actually require. In fact, when you actually talk about Hindustan Unilever, they have created a distribution system with women in the villages wherein 23% of their distribution infrastructure is run by village women. That's a very interesting, very powerful thing that they've been able to create. But that is where the whole construct of shared value comes in. How do I actually create shared prosperity? How do I actually get people to really come in and find entrepreneurial systems? Vatsalya is a very interesting hospital system wherein they've been able to create 19 hospitals in south of India with 100 beds each, but talk about a certain set of disease segments only and operate in tier two and tier three cities. So what I'm coming from is, there is entrepreneurial activity that is happening, but the most significant entrepreneurial activity is happening with, beyond the technological systems that we really want to talk about. The act, entrepreneurial activity is happening wherein we are talking about business model innovations and nothing else. If you really look at it, there is something very interesting that happens. It's about distribution, it's about end use. How do I actually create products for end use? What is it that I'm actually able to do? So if you really look at it, it's all about, when you talk about Tata Swatch or Purit, these are very interesting water cleaning or filter systems that have actually got created. And but that was done for a local region, which has actually created a lot of innovation, a lot of aspects wherein the quality of life of people has actually improved. So we have to go beyond that thinking and really move ahead. But last point, which I really wanted to share, say once again, in a competitive economy, we have to understand one thing, that there is nothing like a high-tech industry or a low-tech industry, it's all about firms and nothing else. And that's what India actually needs as of today. Thank you. So Amit, thank you for a, a really thoughtful uh, presentation. A lot of things that you hear about when you talk about entrepreneurship, you really did not mention much today. And yet I think some of the things are uh, really very profound in this kind of a view. You talk about, oh, you'll hear uh, people talk about needing to create success stories, needing to create, uh, well, you know, how, how would you look at that as a factor in India now? Are entrepreneurs celebrated in India? Well, of course, uh, we are seeing that entrepreneurs are becoming celebrated in India. Uh, we are seeing that, there, yes, of course, when we actually see snap deal happening or when we are seeing some local yeah. manufacturers of cell phones happening, they are getting celebrated. But of course, there is also a side story to it. The side story is that they are actually a replica of something from here itself. It's not about being fairly innovative. When we actually have a kind of enterprise called Micromax, which sells telephones, but the sourcing is actually happening from China. Yeah. So of course, they are able to create a brand, but they've just not been able to do something unique or different. Uh -huh. So the, que the question here is, yes, there is some celebration, but I, I think we are still far away from what we need to actually achieve in the next 10 or 20 years. But I do think that it's a really good point that the opportunities are in solving social problems and in really getting you know, the needs of the country met. That's a very profound point. A lot of that rem reminds me of the bottom of the pyramid discussions from uh, C.J. Prahalad mm -hmm. right, some years ago. Um, do you think that India's market will be the main driver for entrepreneurship going forward, or will you have more international activities, Glo well, aiming for global markets. Very clearly, I think it's going to be India's requirements which are going to drive uh, activity there. It's going to be India's requirements which is going to drive a lot of things. If you really look at it, why is it that people want to come to India? It's, it's because you are actually talking about an opportunity to solve yeah. something. Because then I say that within the problems reside the opportunities in India itself. Mm -hmm. You have a bad infrastructure, what do I do with infrastructure? Can I create a cold chain? That's where entrepreneur en enterprise can actually happen. When you talk about Unilever, that's a very interesting example of creating a distribution network in villages itself. They are able to create a distribution network which is supremely efficient, wherein you are able to sell products in 650,000 villages. Yeah. 
So it is about local conditions. That is where things are going to happen. In fact, when you talk about something like an activity for an IT-enabled services firm or whatever, I do not see it as a big thing because its impact on people yeah. is fairly limited. Yes, of course, it does create a very powerful brand, but it does not really have a huge impact on people on the ground. Maybe in terms of solving problems and giving services, yes, but in terms of distribution of wealth, no. Excellent. Let's open the floor. I mean, yes. You said that uh, without trust, transfer of technology will not happen. I believe that's the exact quote. And I'm curious, um, both U.S. and European corporations, um, you could argue, didn't have a problem with trust in China. So did China sort of break that model for India because it preceded it and there was so much IP theft that occurred there? Or is the circumstance just different for India? Okay. Uh, when I'm actually giving the whole idea of trust, I'm very specifically talking about the pharmaceutical industry. When I'm actually talking about the drug discovery and so on and so forth and healthcare setup. Uh, I've also understood one thing that when you talk about uh, IP issues within China, uh, wherein you actually had software, piracy and so on and so forth, uh, there is always a jury which is out which says whether it was deliberate or whether it was something else. There's always been a debate that it was a deliberate thing or a ploy of the software engineers to really create a network effect. Because if I actually get stuck into a certain operating system, then there is something that's going to happen. So probably that was a deliberate thing. Because that's the understanding or debate that we always have in India, at least within the software segment. But when you actually talk about trust, I believe trust is always an element which has to happen. And I think when you are talking about China, there are systems, when Apple manufactures in China, there is no evidence of the fact that they have been compromised somewhere. Yeah, because you might actually have Shumi, which is coming in, but it is a replication or a ripoff of what Apple does. But there is no evidence to see that this, somebody has been able to blatantly copy anything out there. So China did manage that. Their, their system was very, very powerful in terms of managing it. And that is where the whole structure of India versus China also happens. India is a democracy with a court system that, that takes time at points in time. You have to go through that process. China could actually manage things much more swiftly and much more faster. Uh, so, yeah. a question to you, sir. Um, I know the, yeah. no, louder, okay. sure. the trust and other things are all being lagging for a long time there. So what, what specific things that you see that there is a little momentum of entrepreneurship that you see right now cause that effect? What was not there before, what was there right now that is causing a small momentum? You know, like, the biggest change that I see in India today uh, is about accepting that you have to solve social problems. Go beyond the very thinking of just having something to do with IT. I think we were just stuck in that whole IT bubble for 20 years. For the first time, I'm actually seeing that people are wanting to go out of that IT bubble and say, yes, there are opportunities beyond IT as well. There are opportunities beyond software firms or beyond uh, what you call call center firms and so on and so forth. Today, people are saying, I'm going to create a social venture and we are, they are already talking about impact investing. They are going to create social ventures which are going to solve problems. We are already seeing uh, the evidence for that, for that. In fact, very interesting example which I would like to uh, share here. There's an enterprise which is run by a guy called Jordan Castello uh, called Vision Spring. Uh, in fact, he found that 200 million people in India actually need eyeglasses. 200 million is a huge number. Right? So how, what do you actually do? So he tried to create a business model wherein he's able to give a pair of glasses for a dollar to people and still makes money out of it. So that's where the whole action is. Because when you say that, you can actually go on to say that oh, the number of uneducated people in India are huge. We have 400 million people who are uneducated. But that means, yes, there is a possibility of creating impact either by way of technology or creating something See, creating that whole IT platform to really deliver a service which is very much required. So that is where it is. People are looking at solving those problems. That is where opportunities are coming up. That is where we are celebrating the people today. I think India has moved on and saying, we will celebrate the social enterprises. We will celebrate people who help us solve the problems of the general people than to just talk about simple things. Yeah. So there's... Uh a great deal of interest, I think, in the Silicon Valley community about what's going on in Asia, and including a lot of people who would like to invest in Asia and so forth. 
Could you comment a little bit on the roles of the diaspora from India that is here in the U.S.? And also, just how can people here take advantage of the opportunities in, in India in a positive way? I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know, any kind of exploitation. Oh, in fact, when you talk about diaspora, I, I was just looking at a few numbers a couple of days back. $22 billion of worth of uh, what do you call money was transferred to India from diaspora in the United States in the last one year. So that's a very interesting investment cycle that is actually happening. Of course, whether they're in, uh, investing in enterprises or they're investing in uh, what, what do you call in property, we do not know, but they are certainly sending that kind of money out there. Uh, the diaspora is now becoming more and more interested in terms of investing in newer set of ideas. They've also started understanding. I think in the last couple of years, we are seeing a very interesting or a dramatic shift where the diaspora believes that we need to solve problems of the people there, and they're willing to invest in those businesses. Uh, so they've gotten out of the IT bubble. They, certainly, for sure. Yeah. In fact, I was actually with a, I, I don't mind even naming a person, I was with a guy called Shekhar Narsimhan, who is one of the most prominent people out of the diaspora in the uh, United States. He is today talking about solving social problems in India. He's saying, can I actually create a business model for really talking about sanitation within villages? Can I actually create a model wherein we are able to create a, a village level solar infrastructure, which becomes self-sufficient, wherein once the investment happens, the cycle gets created to really run it through. So today we are actually talking about those set of ideas. I think for the first time in India, we are going back to what I would call as the Gandhian idea of economics. The Gandhian idea, I always say, was about creating local resilient structures. And that is what we are actually seeing. So create local models of business. Probably they could be, they're not scalable, but they are at least replicable. Because within the Indian context, you cannot create scalable models. You can create very smart, replicable models. So in this area, a lot of people have talked about the new middle class in India. How would you say the role of the, quote, middle class fits into this? And First that, of all, <laughs> in terms of defining middle class, but. Mm -hmm. You know, like, defining middle class in India itself is a very interesting paradigm. For a, for a simple reason, what could be defined as middle class here is not middle class uh, uh, in the Indian context. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I still remember there's a very interesting folklore that goes through that when Honda came into India, uh, their uh, definition of middle class was, oh, they, they looked at some numbers and it said that India actually has some million people who are in the middle class. Their estimate was that they are going to sell about 100,000 cars in the first year. It never happened. For a simple reason, the very definitional aspect was actually different. Because what we were saying middle class in early 90s was hugely different from what we were actually looking at. But having said that, I, I think there is going to be a lot of wealth which is going to get generated at the top end of, or top end, or top 300 million people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the opportunities are not, are anyways there. They are getting exploited. But I see the future set of opportunities happening at the bottom 900,000 million pe uh, people. Because that is where, if I'm able to create a model, wherein I'm able to serve those 1,000 million people, can I actually do something interesting? In fact, let me give you an example here, GSK for that matter. Uh, GSK in Africa, Galaxo Smith Clean in Africa, has just really turned its whole business model on its head. They were, the, in fact, I just met the CEO recently and he actually said something very interesting. He said that, you know, in Africa we are saying rather than making a million dollars out of 10,000 people, I would like to make a million dollars out of a million people. So today people are talking about pushing products to a larger humanity, larger set of people. Now, talk about what you call high volume, low margin models rather than anything else. So that yeah. is where the opportunity is. Yeah, if I go back and I think about what we featured here in the previous years, we had the CEO of Redbus one year. Mm -hmm. And Redbus was basically amalgamating the system for purchasing bus tickets because it used to be every company's tickets had to be purchased through separate channels. Anyway, they were bought by a Chinese company a year or two after he came and spoke here. I'm, uh, does anybody know what happened to Redbus after they got bought by the Chinese company? What happened? Is, uh, uh, they were there, and uh, uh, that's the, uh, the new company called uh, the IBBO, that's a Chinese company, as you said. Uh -huh. But they already have some kind of these kind of uh, like a, a ticketing mechanism sales. Yeah. They offered a price and then they bought it. I see. So that's, that's how they were being bought. So they're continuing in India. They're, 
It is, it is continuing. It is still a well-known market there, as per my knowledge. Um, okay. But, uh, but they know, like, as you said, that uh, the founder is no longer continuing. I see. Okay. So funny as now, Fanindra Sama, who is the CEO there, he has actually now become somebody who is investing in social enterprises and things. So he exited out of that enterprise. The enterprise still exists. But quite interestingly, uh, I think it, Redbus was picked up for a very interesting proprietary platform that they had actually built, which mm -hmm. was something very unique for India. And that's where the valuation was. Yes, sir. Since you uh, placed the quite heavy on the trust as a very key element. Now, with the infrastructure situation in India, that means before you really have a very good infrastructure built up, then the trust of, among all the scattered people regions in India is not going to be very helpful for the enter entrepreneurship. I would somehow disagree with your assertion on this. Uh, and I have to disagree with that assertion. And I disagree for a simple reason. If I go with the idea of creating infrastructure in India, it's not going to happen in the next one decade. It might actually happen in the next two or three decades. So what do we actually do now? How do we actually create systems wherein we are able to uplift people? So it, exactly. So you are actually going to use uh, maybe telecom devices. And it has become ubiquitous in India. 900 million people actually use uh, telephones today in India and mobile devices. So can I actually create elements of engagement around this? And of course, that element of trust wherein I'm not doing any breach of contract or whatever, which is actually just, uh, which, which is going to stay, and which makes the system move forward. Because that, that's the way it is. It's something like the Uber that actually happens here. Uber is all about trust. It's about a simple guy who comes in and creates a model and just takes it there. So are we actually in a position to create those set of things in India? Infrastructure is not going to happen immediately. We know that. I think we have to sort of talk about things which are beyond infrastructure. Because if I stay with that battle, then I think we would lose that battle. We are definitely going to lose that battle. Go ahead. Um, I'm just curious how easy it is to set up a business in India, because I've, I've heard stories it could take nine months to get a telephone installed. And you know you, you have to maybe know people in the government or bribe them or for to, to do these types of things. So uh, do you work with the government to improve these the red tape? OK. Uh, I think the, what you're talking about was probably is a 10-year-old story. It's not the story for today. Today, you can get a telecom or a telephone connection in less than an hour. Right? Even if you're a foreigner who is visiting India, you can actually get a connection at the airport itself. In terms of formation of firms, it has also become supremely easy right now. If you go by the doing business indicators, it says it takes 89 days. But we have also seen that if you're actually wanting to start an IT firm, say especially an e-commerce firm, you can actually set up the firm in less than two days. So there are systems that are in place. We are moving into that direction. So for what you call it, to register a firm is not becoming an issue. To doing business is not an issue. When you talk about corruption itself, I don't think corruption is something which is stopping people from doing something uh, or to actually become entrepreneurs. Corruption could actually be there at the higher system or a higher level. But, or, in fact, when you actually say corruption itself, I have to talk about this thing that corruption is actually seen at, it's always a win-win situation for a lot of people. So corruption on the street in terms of bribing a police officer or whatever could actually happen, but it is not really doing something which is killing you. So that, that is where it is. Uh, I'm not trying to defend corruption. What I'm saying is it is not really stalling the system. Actually, I'll, I'll independently vouch for that because there was a study of corruption across different economies in Asia not too long ago, and central government corruption, almost none. Uh, local governments where you have to, you know, talk to the local security police or, or whoever, right, that, that was happening. But I think that the real issue, and this, this uh, survey was about five years ago, so it's getting old. The real issue was that just the legal system is very slow and overloaded. And because people are so careful, the courts are so careful in the way that they administer the law, there was something like a caseload waiting to be heard of over you know, 20 million cases or 30 million cases or something like that. This was a few years ago. Oh, yeah. I don't remember the numbers, but yes, what you're saying is absolutely right. So it's just about the legal process, yeah. which could take a long time because of the overload that we actually see there. Uh, but then hopefully we would be able to manage it over a period of time mm -hmm. and how, how processes could actually happen. Because today we are talking about higher number of judges, 
and so on and so forth. So that, that change is bound yeah. to happen. The change but from previous governments to support really employment increase to the current government's support on entrepreneurship, how is that playing out concretely? What kind of real differences do you see? You know, like at least uh, the present regime is just about a year old. Yeah. So we don't see any evidence in terms of numbers which can tell me that there is a whole huge shift in entrepreneurial activity. But at least if I see the kind of buzz that we see, uh, the kind of talking points or the kind of coverage that we see in the media, we see that, yes, people are becoming interested mm -hmm. uh, in enterprise, enterprise creation and entrepreneurship, and more so in the last couple of years. So there is that movement that is actually happening. But for the evidence, I think we still have to wait for a year or two to, for, some, for some data to really come through in terms of like the investments that the government is doing, uh, what is the kind of impact that's happening yeah. because of that. I, I think that impressionistically, last week at TICON, the uh, very large um, conference on entrepreneurship put on by the Indus Entrepreneurs, um, was a much more upbeat feeling than I've seen in many years. Oh, yes. Uh, and very positive and a lot of people really interested. There were something like 3,000 people there. So this was down in the Santa Clara Convention Center. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, after you. Um, I just read this this morning. Um, India basically has the largest number of expats around the world, 14.2 million, that have remitted $70 billion in the last year back to the old country. Um, that's a, an enormous amount of wealth that's essentially uh, in productivity that's not directly impacting India. Many of the other East Asian countries, especially the Asian Tigers, had a sea turtle type program where they were encouraging folks that had come out to the West uh, and had picked up educational skills or business skills to return. Is Indian government thinking of something similar? Is that likely to happen? I think, uh, I, I do not know what the government is thinking about it, but I can just tell you as to what is the anecdotal evidence to this. Uh, if you really see what has happened in the last 12 to 14 months or 12 to 15 months, uh, the diaspora is being or is getting connected to very, very strongly from the Indian government side. Uh, I think the prime minister on his various visits has actually made it a point to connect to the diaspora. And that, that is what is happening. And he's probably doing it because he sees that there is a possibility of diaspora getting connected back home, probably in terms of investments. Uh, to really do some, uh, probably even coming back and doing some activity out there. Uh, there are some programs that we are seeing, uh, we have not seen the success of it as, as yet, but there are programs wherein they are trying to invite professors who are working out here. There are so many Indian professors in engineering and management who work out of India, or sorry, out of United States, they're trying to really get them back as well, even if for a short period of time. They are celebrating more and more people who are living outside. So we are seeing that evidence at least that yes, the government is reaching them or reaching out to them and trying to really engage them in a bigger way. Yes, sir. No, many times they talk about infrastructure, infrastructure, you know. Actually, it is having physical infrastructure is one, but using it efficiently is something else. Uh, just to give an example, Indian uh, IT uh, all over the world, they streamline the processes for banks. But you go to a bank now, and you have to fill out the papers, they take forever. And that's one. And second thing is, uh, you go to uh, uh, airport, and there's a big line there, you know. Uh, they could streamline those just like what they do it in the USA. And the same people, the Indians are working on this uh, automation things in uh, USA, but why don't they, you know, do it back there? And the third thing is, the I, I send, uh, I export things to India. From here to Mumbai, it goes in 70 hours max. And from Mumbai to Hyderabad, it takes four days or five days because of customs. And then the third thing is, they have to change the whole concept of vacations. If a festival happens on Thursday, uh, uh, they, they close on Thursday. They have to move it towards uh, weekends, something like in America, and also they have to make a lot of vacations uh, optional if people want to take it. You know, even like there are some festivals, you know what I'm talking, there are festivals like only 1%, 2% celebrated, but it is a whole country gets shut down because okay. of uh, okay. May I things. ask you the comment? Yeah, okay. Uh, first, I disagree with everything that you have said. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Very simple. India does not shut down because of its holidays. In fact, let me actually tell you that there are 12 holidays that the government of India mandates. Uh, so it is just 12 holidays in a year. I think in a country which is as diverse as India, 12 holidays for religious reasons is not a big issue. And I think we need to just respect that. I, I think it is about celebration of diversity in the Indian context. Moving it to, say, Saturdays and Sundays, not possible yet. Can I actually change Christmas from 25th December every year to something else? We can't do it. So it's very simple. So let it be that way. Now, the second thing that you actually said in terms of customs, uh, yes, and passing through customs and whatever, that might be actually true. And quite likely, it has to be true. But the question is, there are processes that are actually happening wherein you're trying to change uh, those set of things. But there were those two points that you actually said. Can, if you can just quickly repeat that, the first one and the second one. Which I really wanted to point out, too, that you were wrong on that. The, the, uh, uh, no, the, the banks, too. Oh, know. yes, OK. So only a bank account. I think you, you were talking about a time which was probably 24 months back. ICICI Bank. No, there must be something that is happening there. But today, you can open. Anybody in India who has an Aadhaar card can open an account in less than an hour. So the government of India actually started this whole financial inclusion scheme, where an opening an account for people is not an issue at all. 16 uh, what do you call crore accounts were opened in less than a day in India, in less than a day or in less than a week. So that means there are things of financial inclusion which are functioning. There are steps which the government has actually taken. No, so so okay. many Wait, signatures. No, no, no. I, I don't think so. I, I'll have to disagree with that. But I think as a business, maybe they're going through that, uh, probably. But at least at the individual level, there is a clear evidence that there is a positive thing that has actually happened. I think to wrap things up, uh, go ahead. I just started a movement this year called Giving Back for India. So it's actually a mentoring program, giving entrepreneurship and skill set what we learned in the last 20 years. So it just you just said that there is government is kind of reaching out. Could you elaborate on that? Maybe we, you can help us. No, in fact, when I say government is reaching out, if you really look at what happened in the United States and New York, for the first time, the prime minister is coming and saying that let's do something. And I can certainly tell you that there are people who have written to the prime minister's office, and they've got a response in less than a week. And so there is a personal level interest that is being taken right now in terms of how we can actually work together. And there is a clear evidence to that. I, I think Things are changing, and things are changing very rapidly. The only question is going to be, when do we see that impact on ground? I think we're still about four years to 10 years away from seeing that impact on the ground. Right? India is a gargantuan a country. It, it'll take time for that whole elephant to change or even move into a certain direction. But I'm very hopeful that it'll move into a direction which is very positive. I'm glad because you say hopeful. Because I started with that hope <laughs> in 2015 <laughs> to give back for India. It's a mentor program to start up. So maybe you can help us later on. Absolutely. Let's have Thank a quick you. chat after this. OK. Uh, I think that the kind of disagreement we see is an indication of a system in change. And really, it is, you know, different experiences and, and how things are moving forward. The last thing that I want to remind everyone that you had said, though, is it really is private sector that's going to lead this, right? That it's really the, the people who are creating value and who are trying to solve social problems who will really probably have a much more rapid change in the current system than if you wait for something else to change. So that's a great, it's a great message. And, uh, you know, I want to thank everybody for coming. And please join me one more time in thanking Amit for a great presentation.